Well, first of all, you know, I know there's been a lot of controversy around this statement, it's a great day in South Carolina. When you see this many folks show up for a religious liberty rally, that's a great day in South Carolina, and God bless you all for coming. You know, I've often heard that the, those who control the past control the future. And for those of you that have listened to Common Sense and indeed listened to Tony Beam in the morning, we talk a great deal about how we got where we are in America, both good and bad, because there, there are great aspects of what made America America. And there are some bad aspects now about what's made America the state it's in right now. And those of us that don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So let me give you a little example. Does anybody know why railroad tracks are the width apart they are, the rails? Anybody know the story behind this? The Romans. The Roman roads. And the idea is, is when the chariots first came out, when they first started chariots in the Roman Empire, the width of the wheels was just enough to have the rear ends of two horses pulling the chariot. And for thousands of years after the collapse of the Roman Empire, the width of chariots didn't change. Even into the 19th century, you had in America and in Great Britain, you had this, uh, these horses, the, the horse-drawn carriages were the same dimensions as the Roman roads. And so when they went to build railroads, the rails were in the exact dimensions of what were the, the wagons of the time, which were based on the dimensions of chariots during the Roman times. And so railroads today ride the same width that the Roman chariots did 2,000 years ago. So how many still think history is an irrelevant subject? <laughs> Proverbs 132 tells us that the waywardness of the fool, the waywardness of the simple will kill him, and the complacency of the fool will destroy him. And we've seen a lot of complacency, and we've seen a lot of waywardness at this moment in American history. But if anything gives me hope, it's seeing folks like you show up at noon on a Friday. And that proves that the waywardness can be reversed, and that the complacency can be ended. Now, many people don't know the, the backstory of where we are with the curtailment of religious liberties in this country at this moment in history. Now, I recognize this administration is a great threat to the freedoms we've enjoyed as Americans. The things they've imposed through this Obamacare package and the Department of Health and Human Services not only trample the right to life for an entire generation of Americans by expanding abortion on demand, I mean, these DHHS mandates, let's be honest, this isn't about condoms and birth control pills. It's about abortion-inducing medications. This administration's smart enough. They're not wise, but they're smart. They can read polls. Across every racial demographic, every age demographic, men and women are increasingly pro-life in this country. We've won that. We're winning that fight. We haven't won it, but we're winning it. And we will not stop... We will not stop until the judicial overreach of Roe versus Wade in 1973 is overturned. I don't care if it's through the courts or through the Congress. We will protect the life of all people in the United States of America. But this isn't the first time we've had an administration or government officials curtail the right of us to, re to freely exercise religious conviction. The Johnson Amendment, Lyndon B. Johnson, the President of the United States, of course, who succeeded John Fitzgerald Kennedy in November of 1963. When he was a senator from the state of Texas, he was uh, in favor of, of central planning, just like he was as president. He wanted economic policies that were top-down, government-driven, versus bottom-up as this country was built. And there were two nonprofit entities in the state of Texas. They weren't religious groups, they were think tanks. They were libertarian economic think tanks that were talking about his bad economic policies in Congress. Now, he happened to be up for re-election that year. And these two tax-exempt organizations in Texas were telling people the truth about what Lyndon Johnson was doing from an economics perspective. He knew that was a threat. So in an omnibus spending bill, Senator, then Senator Johnson added what was called the Johnson Amendment. And what it did is it said any organization that's considered tax-exempt cannot interfere with a campaign. You can't endorse a candidate. You can't even speak ill of them. Now, his intention wasn't to go after the churches. It was to go after two policy foundations that opposed him. But it's the law of unintended consequences. From that moment forward, we saw a disengagement of the American pastorate in a way we have not seen in the lifetime of this country. 
There are a handful of pastors that'll still stand up and'll still talk. God bless people like Tony Beam for doing it. Where'd you Where'd you go? There you are. But it's fear. It's the cone of silence. It's intimidation. It's the effort to shut people down and shut them up. Because the government advances lies whenever it expands. Truth and freedom are correlated. If you're going to advance an agenda that stands diametrically opposed to the truth, then you have to shut down people who speak the truth. And our founding fathers understood that two of the most fundamental principles for freedom, and they're codified in the First and Second Amendments, was the freedom of speech and the right to keep and bear arms. And both of those amendments, both of those fundamental rights are there for the same reason. It may not be politically correct. I've been criticized for saying it. The First Amendment's not there for hunters. I mean, the Second Amendment's not there for hunters. It's there to make sure that government doesn't become tyrannical. And the founders fought for free speech for the same reason they fought for that right to keep and bear arms, to keep tyranny from creeping upon the American landscape. And we must stand for both of those principles for the same reason. Because freedom, once lost, is not easily recovered. And Thomas Jefferson, when he was asked about the Second Amendment, he said that those that give up the gun to plow will plow for those that don't. So I would humbly suggest to you today that those of us that give up free speech will speak what we are told. And no society in the history of man has been free without the rights of freedom of religion, the freedom of expression, and the right to worship a God from whom our rights are derived. Amen. The question ultimately becomes this at this moment. The administration, they've put up little, little posters. We've seen the billboards all around South Carolina. We've seen them all around the country. And it says contraception will soon be contraband. And they try to paint conservatives and, and Republicans and people of faith as extremists who want to prevent birth control pills from being on the market and roll back condo manufacturers. I don't know a single Republican in Congress that has proposed such a piece of legislation. I've never supported such a piece of legislation. But I will tell you this. There are two fundamental problems with these health and human services mandates. One, even if it was related only to traditional methods of birth control, you cannot under our Constitution, under the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, force a religious organization to provide a good or service that is in diametrical contrast to what it believes. So those of us that are Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian and non-denominational, we ought to stand with our Catholic brethren. Because if it starts with the Catholics, it'll go to the Baptists. You can be for or against birth control, but I promise you this, every person in this audience and the man speaking to you is in favor of religious freedom. I don't care what you think about condoms and birth control pills. But then there's a the more nefarious angle to this. This administration, again to what I said at the beginning, they can read polls. They know that Americans are increasingly recognizing as Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and to deprive an entire generation, over 54 million since 1973, of their rights to life, liberty, and property jeopardizes the life, liberty, and property of everybody else. So in order to advance their agenda of abortion on demand, they tried to wrap it in the language of birth control and condoms and contraceptions, and they put up cute little posters that say contraception will soon be contraband. But if this administration has its way and has its will, religious freedom will be a thing of the past. They will make government in the place of God, because let me warn you this as my last thing today. If we ever, as Americans, abandon the belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God, we will cease to be America. So let's know our past so we can shape the future. He who knows the past controls the future. We know the past. 
And we know that the beginning of tyranny, the tyranny of a creeping socialist state, is the curtailment of religious liberty because when you renounce the idea that God is the rights giver, then government becomes the rights giver. And we reject the liturgy of the left that the government gives and the government takes away. Blessed be the name of the government. Thank you all for allowing me to speak to you today. Thank you for fighting for freedom in South Carolina.